my spirited brothers and sisters. Welcome. Pastor Alfredo was reading from the, the Gospel of John these past couple of weeks. Remember when he read from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. Believe in God. My Father's house has many rooms. If this were not so, I would have told you. I will go and prepare a place for you. Where I go, there you may be also. Isn't that amazing? How first our Lord suffered and died for the forgiveness of our sins. And then he goes and prepares a place for us to be with him. We serve a loving and awesome God. And as was mentioned, the Father's house has many rooms. And with as many rooms that he does have, he also has a big table. So my brothers and sisters, come, join me at the table. For the Lord's table is big enough for us all. Come, my brothers and sisters, and take your place. It was on the night he was betrayed. He took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which will be given up for you. And then he took the cup. He blessed it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink. For this is my blood the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. So as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do so in remembrance of him. So my brothers and sisters, let us eat and let us drink. Dear Lord, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters who are experiencing a troubled heart at this time. We pray that they too know that an antidote to a troubled heart, just like, just like Pastor Alfredo has said, the antidote to a troubled heart is belief, is trust, trust in God. So we pray for all of our brothers and sisters that they may not have a troubled heart, that they to believe in God, pray and, and trust Him and they would be delivered from that. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. Good morning, New Beginnings Christian Community Church family and friends. My name is Pastor Alfredo Peña, and I wanna welcome you to the Church of Reconciliation. We are glad you are worshiping with us this morning. 
Our scripture reading is in the book of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. And the title to my sermon this morning is, Make Us One, Lord. The scripture reading, again, book of John 17, 1 through 11. And it says this, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most living and loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this gift, God, of our faith. And we thank you for this awesome privilege, God, to be able to come together this morning, God, and be united, God, in one purpose, and that is to worship you this morning. Father God, we are so happy and, and so blessed, God, that we've had this time of worship, God, in which we have been ushered into your presence. We have had the opportunity to celebrate communion with you and with each other. And now we continue to sit around the table ready to be fed by your word. I ask, Holy One, that your word this morning be that, that uh, message, God, that it will penetrate, that will penetrate deep in, into our hearts, into our spirit, that go in beyond the walls and beyond the mass, God. I ask, Father God, that this message this morning make us uncomfortable, that it stretches us, God, but that it also be a most intimate and most comforting and encouraging message. And we know that all this is, pow is possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So we continue to study the book of John. Uh, we are at the end of what we know as the farewell discourse, where Jesus is telling his disciples of his departure, where he is preparing uh, the disciples for their journey without him. Today I'm going to preach on the Lord's Prayer, not the one that we uh, are used to uh, when we think about the Lord's Prayer, the one that we find in Matthew and in Luke. Um, that's not really the Lord's Prayer. It's the prayer that the Lord gave us so that we could pray. But he didn't have to pray for forgiveness for his sins, for example. So today we're going to look at the prayer that Jesus actually prayed. I have a question for you this morning. Anyone out there likes to eavesdrop? It's okay, you can, be, you can be honest. I know I do. <laughs> but the funny thing is, and those of you that know me uh, would, uh, can appreciate this, and if you don't know, um, I am hard of hearing. I can only hear with one ear. So eavesdropping for me is really, a, the struggle is real. <laughs> because if I'm in the middle of a conversation, my one ear is already being used up. And so when I try to eavesdrop on the other conversations that are going on, it really is difficult. Uh, but, but why do we like to do that? I think it's because we feel like it's, it's, it's uncensored. It's not filtered. It, 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 we're getting the full story. It's if, as if, if someone doesn't know that we're listening, that, that they will really um, be able to give some information that, that they might withhold um, if they knew that we were listening. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, for some reason, we just find it interesting or enticing. But I mention that because here the disciples are actually um, listening. They can hear Jesus' prayer. Of course, they didn't have to eavesdrop. Um, but it is said that prayer can be a window to our hearts, an uncensored, 
unfiltered window. Prayer reveals a lot about our relationship with God as well. See, when you hear someone pray, you can tell whether the relationship is more formal. Um, you can tell whether it's more casual. Um, or you can tell whether it's more relational, you know, the father-son type of relationship, uh, where it's more on, on, on a friendly term, or when it's more reverent. And here, when we see Jesus' prayer, we, we, see, we see two things that I'm going to... Um, talk about today, or I'm going to point out. And one is we see the relationship that he has with the Father. We see that the unity. We see that, that, that he says over and over that we are one. I am in you and you are in me. And, and, and that relationship is so intimate. But we also see here the love that he had for his disciples and for us. So today we're going to look at three life application points as we usually do on Sunday. So get your pen and paper out so you can be ready to take your notes. As usual, um, we might take a little longer on some of the application points than others, but I think it's important that we cover all of them. So the first life application point as we look at the scripture for today is Jesus prayed for himself. Now we would ask, why would Jesus have to pray for himself? Well, one thing that we, we have to be reminded of is that Jesus here is still human. He's still in his full humanity. And then he also knows um, that, that this is at the end of, of his ministry on earth um, in, his, in his humanity. And he knows what's about to happen. See, we know this because the scripture starts off with him saying, Father, the hour has come. And we have seen other scriptures where Jesus says, it is not time yet. The hour has not come. But he knew that the hour has come. He knew that, that he was about to do what he had come to do. And he says, glorify your son so that you, so that your son might glorify you. What do we mean by glorify your son? How is Jesus going to be glorified? And that is by going to the cross, by, by, by going to the um, doing the ultimate sacrifice, which then gives us the resurrection of Christ. Uh, by doing this, by he will be glorified by, by beating death, by fulfilling the prophecy, by fulfilling the law, by removing the sting of death, by glorifying God through these things. And then he says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. See, during Easter, during Holy Week, we, we learn about um, Good Friday. And it is where we see that Jesus says, it is finished. And here, Jesus is about to seal that um, covenant with us. Where, where he says, I have finished the work. And when he says, it is finished, that means that you and I, we have everything that, that it takes um, for us to be able to, to experience that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But I'm going to ask you this question. As we model what Jesus has done here, are we praying for ourselves? And when we do, are we praying that, that we might finish the work that he gave us to do? Are we praying that he be glorified through what we do and the way we live out our lives? I think it's important. If it's good enough for Jesus to pray for himself, then that's an excellent model for us to pray for ourselves as well. Here's life application point number two. Jesus prayed for his disciples. What did he say? Now, now Jesus knew that his disciples were listening. He knew uh, also that they were going to struggle. He knew that they were in a very difficult place. Remember, this is happening in the upper room where there's, there's some confusion happening because, you know, um, Judas has, has, they found out, has betrayed Jesus, where, where he tells them, Peter is going to deny me, where he washes their feet and they're not sure, you know, what that was about. And then he's telling them, I'm going to leave you and, and you can't go where I'm going right now. And, and so there's a lot of, uh, of distress right now. And Jesus knows this. But he also knows that, that they're going to struggle, that they're going to stumble, and that they will fall sometimes. Yet, in his prayer, he affirmed them. In his prayer to the Father, in his prayer to God, he affirms them. 
Uh, verse 6 says, They have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They know with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. Here, Jesus is affirming their faith. Notice his, his prayer was not, God, I don't know what to do with these guys. God, I cannot believe that after three years with them, they're still going to be, one of them is going to betray me, that they're still going to deny me, that before this is over, they're all going to scatter and I'm going to be left alone. He didn't say any of that, even though he knew that was going to happen. Yet what he did was he affirmed their faith. I think here we see the heart of Jesus. We see the compassion and his loving heart. And he saw their faith and not their failures. And let me tell you, that is, that is so encouraging. Because that is the Jesus that we believe in. The one that, that when he sees you and when he sees me, that he affirms our faith. That he doesn't um, put us in, in a category based on our failures. In fact, that he doesn't even categorize us as that. Instead, he doesn't seek for perfection from us. He seeks that we have strong faith. And here we see that he affirms his disciples. He knew that they had struggles before them. And he knew that he had to pray for them. And he knew that they needed to hear as he was praying to the Father that he was affirming them, that he was pleased with them, that he believed that they were going to be able to do what they needed to do. And he says, protect them by the power of your name. Church, in that time, in that culture, the name was significant. The name had value that was importance. And when he says protect them by your name, he's talking about the power. He's talking about the authority of God's name. It wasn't just a simple prayer. In fact, this prayer has so much value in the fact that, that he's saying with your authority and with your power, protect them. And he affirms them. And let me tell you, that is something that's encouraging for you and for me. As we see Jesus and as we see God, that we know that when he looks at us, he says, you are good. He calls us his masterpieces. And it is, it is amazing to see here Jesus praying for his disciples. And here's life application point number three. And we're going to stay on this one for a little while. Jesus prayed for us as well. See, he prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, but he also prayed for us. If we look a little further down in verse 20, it says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus prayed for us. And again, I think this points to and shows the love and, and the heart that Jesus had for his disciples and for us. And, and the, the best way to show that is the fact that he prayed for us. You know, church, we pray for those that we love. I'm going to share um, a very personal story, but um, one of the things that I, I loved about my mom was that I knew that she always prayed for us. She always prayed for her children. And, and one of the customs in our culture is that anytime we're going to go anywhere, we're going to leave town or we're going to leave, we always got her blessing. And I remember it was, it was very sad for me when my mom went to be with the Lord and, and you know, when she passed away. And I remember for a moment saying, God, who's going to pray for me now? Who's going to give me her blessing? And, and this, this scripture, this, 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 this prayer today should be a very encouraging prayer because the Almighty One, Jesus, the Redeemer of the universe, is praying for us and has prayed for us. And, and that is, is better than, than any prayer that can be offered, is better than anything that we can rely on, is knowing that He prayed for us. But look at what he prayed for, specifically 
that we be one. That is huge. His last night before being crucified. And what did he pray for? He prayed for unity. He didn't pray for health. He didn't pray for wealth. He didn't pray for success, but for unity. Unity within his disciples and unity within us. See, unity was important to Jesus. And today, being united is extremely difficult. You have to agree with me that we are in a point right now where it is, we are very divided as a nation. Why is being united so important and yet so difficult? You know, they did a, an organization called Pew Research, uh, did a study, and they, the findings were really revealing and, and really troubling. This is what they said, they found. People believe that people that have opposing views are the greatest threat to our nation. We live in a society where if you don't believe like me, then you are the enemy. There was a time, church, where, where opposing views, opposing beliefs created some degree of balance. And, and where compromise was a good thing and when we were able to, to look beyond our differences and be able to come together. And today, that is not where we are. Today, we, we live in a society where, where in order for me to be right, you have to be wrong. And, and, and if you don't believe like I do, then, then it, we don't just have a difference of opinion or beliefs. You are my enemy. And I'm telling you, that is what we see today. And it is sad and, and it is it is scary. And and so so today this message is is very important for us. Because remember, this is about having the antidote that the world needs. And and when we look at this research, one of the things that, that we're also finding out is that sometimes the church doesn't look very different than the world. If the ideas out there, the, the mentality out there is that if you think differently than I do, then you are my enemy and you are a threat, I wonder how much of that is getting into our churches. I venture to say quite a bit of it. I don't know that we would have so many churches and so many congregations and so many denominations, I'm sorry, if it wasn't because many times we cannot work past our differences. You know, when we opened New Beginnings, we opened in, in another location, and we didn't realize that on that street, there were five other churches. On that one street, on one block, there were five other churches. <laughs> and it's, it's un unbelievable that, that you know, every, that there were so many churches, but the one thing that, that we remembered and, and that we always remain centered on is every church has a purpose. And, and we can't be, try to be, like this other church. For whatever reason, God had called us to, to, to do this, to fill this, this gap. And so, so we had to remain focused on our vision and, and, and our mission. But, but again, you know, the, the, the interesting thing here is, is that, you know, that mentality is falling into the churches. So why is being united so important and yet so difficult? Again, this is Jesus' prayer. The last thing he, he had the opportunity to pray about, and he prayed for unity. Why? Obviously, that's important. But yet, why is it so difficult? I'm going to give you two reasons. One is that it involves people. <laughs> That's the truth. You and I, people, we can complicate things. We, we, we can, can get caught up in, you know, I said earlier um, that it is important for, more important for us to be right than to be in community. I don't even think that that's a true statement anymore. I think we're more concerned about winning than about being right. And I, and I tell you this because, 
you know, and, and I'm not trying to get political, but when, when I have conversations today about some of the things that we see happening in our country, and we see some of the things that are clearly wrong, and, 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 and I think, how can you not see this? And, and, and when they don't even acknowledge that the something is not right, it's because we are more concerned about winning the argument than we are about compromising or about accepting that we might be wrong. Because if we admit that we are wrong, then it, it might show some kind of weakness or, or we lose. And, and, and that is something that um, we're uncomfortable with. So people complicate things, you know? So what's causing us? Why are we as individuals um, complicating um, what Jesus was praying for us to do, and that is to be united? You know, James 4, 1 tells us, it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Another version says your passions. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The truth is, church, that sometimes we are more concerned about our own passions, our own agendas, our own, um, our own comfort, our, our own ideas, our, our desire to win. And that can get in the way. Here's another reason on why it is difficult. Because the enemy hates and will attack anything that is important to Jesus. If Jesus' last prayer is to pray for unity for us, then you can rest assured that the enemy is going to attack that. And the one thing that we can never overlook is the fact that the enemy is out there ready. In fact, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Unity is important and we complicate it with our own agendas, but it's also complicated because the reality is that, that we have the enemy that, that clearly sees that this is important to Jesus. And so he must attack it. And how does he attack it is through us, the people. See church, the way I see it, there are two different positions, two different ways in which um, we can um, contribute here. We can be used as the answer to Jesus's prayer that we be united and we can work towards being united or we can be the vessels that the enemy uses to destroy what Jesus is trying to accomplish for his people. Two ways. How is how are you contributing? How are you working this out? Are you being that, that vessel of unity? Or are you being that vessel of division? That is an important question, church, and we need to be able to answer it. How are we contributing to our churches today? You know, last week we talked about the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and next week, we're going to celebrate Pentecost Sunday. And then the following week, we begin a very cool and important study series about the Holy Spirit called the Forgotten God. And so, so when we've talked about all these things already and we, and we acknowledge how difficult it is, it is because of our own you know, stuff and because of the enemy, then the only way we're going to be able to overcome all these things is through the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way that we're going to be able to be able to get beyond these, these amazing and, and real obstacles is if we invoke the power of the Holy Spirit. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, then you and I will be able to reach that place of unity to be able to have a common vision, a common mission, and a common purpose. So I'm gonna look at four principles that I think are important as we work towards unity. 
The first one is, we must unite in our belief of who God is. Here in Jesus' prayer, it says, I have revealed you to them, and they have accepted that you are God. And, and you and I, we need to be united in knowing who God is. Number two is we need to be united in, in our belief that we are founded on his word. His word. Not on emotions, not on politics, not on social justice, but on his word. We need to know that this church stands on the word of God. And how do we know that is when we study the word of God. When we, when we make it a priority that we grow in our knowledge and in our wisdom of the word of God, when we're able to have the, the tools and, and the priorities to be able to, to make learning and study of the word of God a priority in our congregation's life. And there's one thing that you should know by now is that, that we believe that it is essential that you and I grow in our understanding of the Word of God. You know, I have an awesome praise report. I am, I'm just excited about this, and I, I want to shout it from the rooftops. Do you know that in our virtual Bible studies, we are now having a greater number of attendants than we did when we were in our own comfortable structures? Do you know Listen, this is really exciting. We are up to 90 people registered to begin the series, The Forgotten God. 90 people that have signed up for us to do this study. So, so how are we going to be able to accomplish this? Is because we are uniting and knowing that, that we are founded on the Word of God. Number three, we need to be united in knowing that God is for us. This means that we have everything that we need to defeat the enemy. That means that yes, we know that, that we can get in the way, and yes, we know that the enemy is going to attack this, but we also need to stand firm and be encouraged in knowing that you and I, we have everything that we need to be successful and victorious. If God is with us, who? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, I'm not minimizing the fact that it can be difficult. You know, it, it, we can feel lonely sometimes in ministry. Um, it can be scary sometimes. And, and it's, we can easily be discouraged. But, but when we come to those moments, we, we need to know that the fight has been fixed in our favor. And that, that just as Jesus prayed for protection for his disciples, he is praying for the same protection for us. That we are protected by the authority and the power of his name. That means that you and I, we are more than conquerors. And number four is we need to be united in the belief that unity is essential. What does that mean? That means that you and I need to understand that it is not optional. That, that you know, church, we can continue to, to separate. We can continue to leave churches. We can continue to create new denominations. We can create, we can continue to divide and divide and divide. But the problem is that we are not conquering. So, so instead of leaving, instead of going somewhere else, maybe we need to say, God, what is it? That, that is preventing me from being that vessel that you need me to be, to, to be a vessel of unity. You know, church, for such a time as this, unity can be our greatest witness. You and I and, and every church out there, if we stood together, we can show the world what unity is supposed to look like and we can do the things that God has called us to do. Unity can be our greatest witness. What does that look like? Together through the power of the Holy Spirit, we go from resistance to creating a current. Some of you have heard me use this example before. But imagine, if you may, that, that you're in a pool, in a swimming pool, and you're walking, 
And when you're walking by yourself, you feel some of the resistance from the water. But I imagine if somebody else comes and walks right behind you, now you still feel some resistance, but it gets a little easier. And imagine if somebody else comes and they come right behind you. And, and, and the more people that come and, and unite, the more that we take from, from feeling that resistance to creating a current. And when we do that long enough, we start being moved by this current. We're no longer creating this, we are moved by it. And, and so, so what I mean by that is when we are united and when the Holy Spirit is working in us and is using us, then you and I will be moving. And, and we, the only reason that we know that it is the Holy Spirit is because our feet are not moving. It's because we, God is moving us. It is that, it is that wind behind us that is pushing us to, to where we need to go. Together, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can create an environment that is appealing to those that don't know Christ yet. See, when, when people see us, they should say, I want to be like them. You know, I see that, that there are so many people that are so different, and yet they still work together. That they're able to accomplish all these things in despite of their differences. And, and people would want to join that. You know, one of the signs of being used by the Holy Spirit is when other people outside of our four walls see what we're doing and say, I want to be part of that. That's what it would look like. But we still have to deal with the human issue. You know, Hebrews 12, one and two says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us one run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I have a couple of questions for us as we close today. Do you want to run the race with perseverance? Do, do, you, do you want to do what God has called you to do? Do you want to live out your passion uh, for Christ? Do, do you want to accomplish and be that vessel that God wants to use? Do you want to do that? Then here's another question. What hinders us from being instruments of unity. What is stopping us from being the answer to Jesus's prayer? What is the sin that entangles us? Could it be a spirit of criticism? Cynicism? Rebellion? Selfishness? Jealousy? See, church, it's really easy to nitpick. It's really easy to tear down. It's really easy to criticize. But today is a day that we have to, to ask God seriously, Holy Spirit, reveal in me what are those things that are hindering me from being that instrument of unity. Holy Spirit, reveal in me what is that sin that I need to release today that is keeping me from being that instrument of unity that you need me to be. Church, today is the day that we make that decision. Today is the day that we, that we take our place and that we understand that we, we need to be able to create this current, that the world really needs us, and that we and you and I need to be able to say that we have completed the work that he has called us to do. Let us run that race in perseverance. Yes, it's not going to be easy, but oh, it is going to be so worth it. Look in your immediate families, in your immediate households, the people that need God so desperately. I know I see it in my own circles. I see the pain that is being caused by divorce. I see the pain that is being caused by, by you know, feeling resentment. And today is a day that we can... Throw all those things off, Scripture says, 
so that we can run the race with perseverance and so that we can be united, so that we can be one as Jesus prayed for us. Make us one, Lord. That is the message for you and for me today. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most loving God, we thank you for this message. We thank you, Father God, because you prayed for us, because through your prayer and through your protection, God, we have everything that we need, and your word reminds us that we are more than conquerors. So we tell you, we thank you for the victories, God, that we have already seen and those that we're about to experience. We thank you, Father God, that, that you make a way for us, we thank you, Father God, that we know that we are not alone, that when we are discouraged, God, when we, when we are scared, that we know that we can come to you, God, because you've already made a way for us. Because we are in you and you are in us and we are one. And, and, and because of that, God, you have already um, made a way for us to be able to enjoy those victories, God. And Holy God, I thank you today God, for, for the acknowledgement, God, that yes, sometimes we get in the way. I thank you today, God, for the confessions and the sins, God, that have entangled us and prevent us from being those instruments, God, that you need us to be, not just for our churches, but for our families, for our places of work, for our communities, God, for this world. And so we thank you today, God, because we know that by the confession of our sins and by accepting, God, that, that you are the one that can set us free, God, from these things. And then we consider it and we, we declare it as done today. And so I thank you for those decisions this morning, God. And oh, holy God, we are excited about what you are going to do in us and through us. I lift up every church right now, God, that has come together, God. I lift all the everyone that's working for the same purpose, for the same mission and the same vision, God, and that is for your kingdom. God, that we're able to come together and create, God, that current, God, that will take us, God, to a place of healing and a place of wholeness. But we understand today, God, that it starts with us that you, Holy God, make us one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It is our prayers, it is every Sunday, that this message and this service blessed you in a mighty way. I invite you to um, come to our website, nb-ccc.org, and you will get some additional information. Let us know how you are doing. Let us know how these services are helping you. Um, also, you're able to get information regarding our Bible studies. Um, that is really important. You have information about our Spanish service at 9 o'clock in the morning. We have our children's church and, and ministry and, and classes and parents. I know you're really excited about that, and so are we. And, and the youth information is coming pretty soon. Again, I remind you, about our study that will be beginning um, in a couple of weeks, The Forgotten God by Francis Chan. We, we will give you all the tools that you need. This is free, so I invite you, you still have time to reach out to us and sign up for this um, study. And also, it's important that you also go to our website and make your financial contributions of love and support for our church. This is an opportunity for you to give your tithing, to give your love offerings, um, and, and, and pray for us to know that, that our work still needs to continue in spite of this pandemic. But we're excited that God is using us in a mighty way, and, and the only um, way that we're able to do this is through the power of the Holy Spirit that's working through each one of you. So thank you for your love. Thank you for your support. Thank you for um, loving us the way you do by way of your financial contributions. Thank you again for joining us. We're excited, and we're looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday for Bible study, and then next week. God bless you.